It's great to see you on this Sunday after Easter. We had a wonderful time together last Sunday morning, and uh, we're so thankful for those of you willing to sit in overflow and make that uh, sacrifice, if you will. Uh, so many wonderful things came out of Sunday 16 being baptized. Uh, we had uh, over 255 children, not students, just children here last Sunday, and uh, you know, our, our vision is to see ordinary people and families find extraordinary life in Jesus. And so whenever you see that number of children, it is always, particularly at Center Grove, a real blessing to our hearts. So we're grateful and we're still rejoicing over last Sunday. We're in a series entitled Know Your God, where we're unpacking who God is as he's revealed himself in the fourth book of the Psalms. And... Uh, We've said that those who live well are those who love God well, and those who love God well are those who know him best. And because we want to love him well, and that uh, requires then that we must know him well. So we're pursuing uh, a deeper knowledge of who God is in his word. Today we're in Psalm 97, as we just saw it or heard it read for us. It gives us a powerful, powerful picture of a future day that is uh, sure to come, a day that will be one of the biggest events in human history. Now, I don't know if you've thought about it or, or uh, reflected on it much, but one of the things I've noticed is that the biggest events of life almost always come with mixed emotions. The biggest events of life almost always come with mixed emotions. Do you remember your first day of school? Mixed emotions. You're getting older, you know, you're getting bigger, you're five, and you're going to kindergarten, but there's mixed emotions because you're leaving your mother, right? So there's mixed emotions. Going to middle school always brings mixed emotions. You're excited about getting older again, but you've heard awful things about middle school, and they're right. And so <laughs> it's got these mixed emotions. Uh, same in high school, your first day in the military, uh, your, your first day in college, uh, your first child. When your first child is born, you have mixed emotions. You're thrilled that the child is there. You have no idea what you're doing, and they scare you to death. Uh, marriage, of course, is that way. Weddings are like that. Inevitably, when I'm, when I'm marrying someone, you know, I spend more time with the groom than I do the bride before we get started, and he's always pacing, and you ask, are you okay? And he always says he is, and everybody knows he's not. And he's pacing, and he's pacing, and he's pacing because he's got mixed emotions. I don't know about the bride, so I, I said to Cheryl yesterday, I said, honey, um, what is it like for brides, you know, on that wedding day before it actually starts? What is it like for, for brides? I mean, are they like the men? Because the men just always seem to be kind of mixed, and the emotions are kind of everywhere, and and uh, she said, well, if you want to know the truth, I said, well, yeah. She said, I wasn't sure about you. <laughs> I said, no, this is 42 years later, and I'm just finding out. Said, what do you mean you're not sure about me? She said, yeah. She said, I, I got on the phone and called one of my bridesmaids and said, I'm not sure about this. <laughs> she said, how does that make you feel? And you know, I thought about it, and it, it actually makes me feel really good. You say, well, why is that? Well, because I know she was taking marrying me seriously. That she wasn't just coming into the marriage going, well, if this doesn't work out, I'll find another one. So she was actually being uh, exactly the kind of woman I wanted to marry because she was taking it so seriously. Uh, now, the good news is she also reports that after 42 years later, she's glad she did it. And that, that did make me feel a whole lot better. But there are always mixed emotions around the biggest events of life. It comes with anticipation and uncertainty, with joy and fear, excitement and dread. All of those things are part of the deal. There's coming a day that will bring the ultimate in mixed emotions. It's a day that has no equal. In the New Testament, 
It's known as the coming or the second coming of Christ. And among professed believers, I've noticed two, two tendencies. I've noticed that for some, there, there is uh, little joy and much awe, even reverential fear when they think about the second coming of Christ. I've known others who, when you talk about the second coming of Christ, it's, it's a, it's, the response is a happy one. There's a gladness. There's not really any awe or fear, just gladness. I'm looking forward to it, they will say, all those kinds of things. And this may surprise you, but the reality is those that know a lot of awe and very little joy and those that know a whole lot of joy and not much awe are both right and they're both wrong. In a sense, they're both right and they're both wrong. The second coming of Christ ought to inspire both a reverential fear and an awe, as well as a joy and glad anticipation. In fact, unless it does, I want to say that you don't really understand it. That if you really understand the second coming of Christ, you will always have both. Not just one or the other. Why? Well, Psalm 97 shows us with a powerful prophetic picture of that day that's still to come. And it shows us why we should feel both fear in terms of reverential fear. I know perfect love casts out fear, but this is reverential fear and gladness all at the same time. And then it points to how we can have those things. So I want you to notice with me as we unpack Psalm 97. In verses 1 and 2, we see the king who reigns forever. In verses 3 to 9, we see the king who comes at the end, and in verses 10 through 12, we see the king who protects in the meantime. So we see the king who reigns, the king who comes, and the king who protects in the meantime. Let's look closely together at this picture of the God who comes, and let's look for some awe, and let's look for some gladness as well, shall we? First, look with me at verses 1 and 2, the king who reigns forever. The Lord reigns, the uh, psalmist says, and we've heard this before already, haven't we? The Lord reigns, the Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Let the peoples everywhere be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. So you'll notice the psalm opens with this familiar uh, declaration and affirmation that the Lord reigns. The idea is that he is a king and that he is an eternal king. He's always reigned. He is reigning now. He will always reign. There's never been a time when he wasn't king. So here he is, the creator of all. He is owner of all. He is over all. He has the authority and the right to do with us and to do with his world as he will. So the extent of his of his rule is all inclusive, all things, all people under his authority. He is king, that means he is also lawgiver, and he has the right to make laws for our lives and to reward or punish us accordingly. And he's used that, that right with his laws for life given in his word. The Ten Commandments are, are a summary of, of what his laws for life are. So he is king, he is king forever, he is lawgiver and uh, he is over all. And so the psalmist, in view of all this, calls on the earth and all peoples to respond to this eternal king with rejoicing and gladness. Now, we don't tend to rejoice over people who give us rules, do we? We, we don't tend to do that, where our nature runs counter to that. And yet, the uh, psalmist calls for uh, those to, uh, who recognize this to rejoice. Why? Well, look at verse 2. It explains it. Rejoicing and gladness aren't simply because there is a king who reigns, but rather because of, watch now, who the king is and how he reigns. Now, we don't know everything there is to know about this great king. This, the uh, scripture says in, verse, in verses 1 and 2 that clouds and darkness surround him. We, we don't know everything. We can't see everything about him. But what we can know and what we do know is Two things, notice, do you see it? We see two things, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. And that's the reason why there is joy and rejoicing at this king. 
Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. It's good news. It really is. Righteousness refers to God living in right ways, always in his relationships. It refers to his, his, his habit of conducting all of his relationships. Watch this. With, with fairness, with generosity, with even handedness. There is never a time God in his relationships is not fair and generous and even handed. Not one of us can say that. God always can say that. He also has justice at the foundation of who he is and at the foundation of his throne. In its most basic form, it means he treats people fairly. It means that he will clear those who are innocent and he will punish every person uh, who is guilty. He will treat everyone on the basis of their merits, the merits of their case, regardless of race or social status. So when justice is at work, when God's justice is at work, anyone who does the same wrong will be given the same penalty. There's no impartiality with this God. He's even, he's just, He's fair. No government you and I have ever lived under has ever been able to make that claim. He can. He does. And so when the Bible brings these two together, as it does in verse 2, it gives us a powerful picture of who God is and how he reigns. He is righteous. He is just. Always be counted on to reign and to lead in ways that are right and good. He loves what is right. He hates what is evil. He loves justice. He loves, and, 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 and how many of you have ever been wronged? Let me just see, just a quick survey, okay? Everybody except a few people with issues, okay? That's uh, everybody, all right? So, uh, Every one of us has been wronged, and for every one of us who's ever been wronged, this is good news because he's going to make all wrongs right. He's going to make all wrongs right. He loves justice. He loves justice. He insists on fairness. He hates the ill treatment of people by people. And he can always be trusted to provide true justice wherever evil and injustice exist. And this is a reason for joy. Celebrate. He's come. Celebrate. This is who he is. Watch this, though. This eternal, righteous, and just king is also the king who comes at the end. Look at verses 3 to 9. So I want you to notice something with me. Between verse 2 and verse 3, there's a shift. And it's a startling kind of shift. You go from eternity in verses 1 and 2, you go to the future beginning in verse 3. You go from eternity to a time in the future with the past being used to help us grasp what's coming. I'll show you why in a minute. But the psalmist moves from the fact that of God as eternal king to a picture of his coming that is both exciting and actually chilling all at the same time. The king of all comes at the end as judge of all. Look at verse 3. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. So he is, suddenly he is this eternal king who has righteousness and justice as the basis of his throne. Suddenly he is coming and fire goes before him. His lightnings, verse 4, light up the world. The earth sees and the earth trembles. Everyone sees, everyone trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness as he comes, and all the peoples see his glory. Now here in verses 3 to 6, we are shown what this kingship means for the future. And to help us see it, the psalmist actually reaches back to an event from Israel's past when God came earlier appearing to his people. You might know the story in Exodus 9, the story of Israel at Mount Sinai. After Israel had left slavery in Egypt, the nation was led to Mount Sinai. And after Israel arrived, the day came when there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud enveloped the mountain, covering Mount Sinai with smoke. And we're told that the Lord himself descended on it with fire and the mountain shook. And the sights and the sounds were so terrifying that all the people, including Moses, trembled with fear. And Moses was called to come up to the mountain to be with God and to hear God himself. And it was there God gave him the law. 
like his coming in Exodus 19, Psalm 97 says, this awesome God of righteousness and justice will come one day and prove himself to be the king. How? He will reveal himself again with clouds and thick darkness, with lightning and fire. But this time, verse 3, his fire will consume his foes on every side. He will come to bring judgment on all who reject the things that are important to him. And so God's arrival in terrible majesty means that God has come to enforce his standards for life expressed in his laws of life. And the destruction of God's foes means an end of evil, an end to injustice. His intervention proves that he's committed to doing what is good and to seeing that good prevails. And so this king who is shrouded with clouds and darkness is suddenly also the king who comes with fire going before him, lighting up the world as he enters, impacting the created world, so much so that the mountains melt in his presence. Do you see Even the things that are most real to us and most substantial and most fixed like a mountain fall apart in his presence to show that nothing is more real, nothing more substantial, nothing more fixed than he is. And all those who witness this tremble. His coming, the scripture says, reveals his righteousness, his rightness. And all who witness it see that he alone has great glory or great majesty, verse 6. And so God appears and he's seen for who he is. There's no doubting it. There's no avoiding it. And everything else is seen for what it really is too. The worth, the value, the permanence of everything is called into question in God's presence Everything that we believed to be true that was not true, suddenly it's very obvious it was a lie because there's nothing more real, more substantial, of greater worth, of greater value than the presence of God in that moment. We finally see him like we've never seen him. But there's a catch here, watch. We finally see ourselves like we've never seen ourselves either. Everyone alive sees his coming and everyone sees finally what is real and true about them and about him. And as a result, look at verse 7, there's a separation that happens. All worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boast in worthless idols. Put to shame. Worship him, all you gods. None of their gods can stand before this king. But look at verse 8, Zion hears and is glad and the daughters of Judah rejoice. These are those who worshiped the eternal king. They are glad, they rejoice. These are believers. And they rejoice because of his judgment. So one group that has worshiped idols are suddenly put to shame for their worship. One group that has lived for all of those things that uh, are God's substitutes are suddenly put to shame for their worship of those things and their wrong use of their lives. Everything they boasted in, everything they lived for is shown as worthless. All the demonic forces behind those false gods are forced to bow to him. Another group is shown in contrast to them, the faithful represented by Zion and Judah. They hear, they see, they're glad because of the judgments of the Lord. He shows, he takes his commandments seriously and they celebrate it. And now look at verse 9. Everyone knows for you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all the things we've called God. God's faithful people, though often mocked for their faith, they're now vindicated. And so coming in judgment, his coming in judgment, though terrifying to everyone, brings, watch, shame to some and great joy to others. Someone has said the same sun that melts butter hardens clay. The same sun that melts butter hardens clay. And so you've got this one coming and it has two different effects. Shame on the one hand and joy on the other. But all tremble, all tremble. Two different effects. Some detest him and are ashamed before him. Some delight in him and celebrate what he's done. Now, I've got to tell you, this is odd. We all tend to view judgment in a negative light, and here it's seen in a positive light, and it's viewed with rejoicing. And, and at first, it's obvious why, because God brings justice to the earth and to human experience. And, and again, he's making wrongs right, and anybody who's been wronged is going to celebrate that. But some, 
something's off here. The, the Bible tells us there are four things that God can never do. He can't lie, he can't die, he can't deny himself, and he cannot delight in sin. He can't lie, he can't die, he can't deny himself, and he cannot delight in sin. He's so holy that he can't behold sin, and he's got to punish it wherever he finds it. Every sin, Hebrews 2 says, requires a just recompense, a, a consequence. And God never clears the guilty. He, he never just says, well, it's okay. I'm going to overlook it this time. He just never does. It's contrary to his nature. He never clears the guilty. Sinners deserve to die for their sins. That's what the scripture says. That's what God said. Because God is righteous and just. Sin can't uh, escape unpunished. And suddenly the, the trembling and the fear, we get it. The joy and the rejoicing, not so much. Why? Because, well, I'll just confess for me. I won't confess for you. I've sinned more than once. I'm guilty more than I know. And this is hard for us, but Few things are stressed more strongly and consistently than God's work as judge. He's repeatedly presented as judge of all. Uh, this divine judgment is in the scripture is presented as a reality during our lives and then at the end of life, at the end of history, rather. The New Testament is... is Included in this, it's not just the Old Testament where you see God is judged and somehow he's changed in the New Testament. No, no, the New Testament is overshadowed by the coming day of universal judgment called the day of wrath and the day of judgment. It proclaims Jesus as the divinely appointed Savior to be sure, but also the divinely appointed judge. The ultimate divine appearing wasn't, of course, at Sinai, but at Christ's first coming in Bethlehem. With his incarnation, the final appearing will be in his second coming where he's presented after his resurrection and ascension as ready to judge the living and the dead. Paul announces that God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, Jesus. Now, we all love the sweet little baby Jesus at Bethlehem in the manger. We, we love him. And we're glad for the reason why he came. But a lot of times, we don't carry the full picture of this Jesus. If you, if you want a, uh, a real sobering view of, of this Jesus when he comes, read Revelation 19, 11 to 16. Then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it was faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. And the description just becomes chilling. And it's like, whoa. Bethlehem, I can, I can, I'm comfortable with. This I'm not so comfortable with. And yet it is the same Lord Jesus. In the Old Testament, the prophet Amos called out, prepare to meet your God, but Today, God's call is prepare to meet the risen Christ. Now, see with me finally in verses 10 to 12, the king who not only reigns and the king who comes, but the king who finally protects in the meantime. Here, the psalmist makes plain that uh, what the future coming uh, of the eternal king can mean for us today. He says, O oh, you, verse 10, who love the Lord, hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and joy is sown for the upright in heart. The psalmist shows that believers can live now in the presence of this coming eternal king and, and then he shows us how. that They can live ready for the king and ready for the judge to come by doing this. Oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. This is how you can be ready. This is how you live ready. There are two lessons here. I'll point you to them quickly. First, the lesson is this. Love of the Lord and the hatred of evil go together. 
love of the Lord and hatred of evil go together. You can't have one without having the other. And that's why whenever, you, whenever you're entertaining, if you're a follower of Jesus, whenever you're entertaining sin in your life, and you know when you're doing it, uh, I know when I'm doing it. Whenever you're entertaining sin in your life, you know you're not loving God, that your love for him has fallen, faltered, is failing. Love of the Lord and, and the hatred of evil go together. Those who truly hate evil will find themselves loving the Lord, and those who love the Lord can't help, truly love him, can't help but hate evil wherever they find it, first in themselves, of course, and then in the world around them. So this command is to oppose what opposes the Lord in their lives and in the lives of others. It's a command that comes with a promise, as you see it, that the Lord will preserve and deliver, verse 10, and so light and joy, verse 11. He will preserve and deliver them from his enemies and theirs. And one of the chief ways he does that is to sow into their lives light and joy. He will plant his word in them like seeds sown in their hearts. He will take and nurture it so that his word sprouts and grows and yields a harvest of life and of joy, of happiness and satisfaction, regardless of what others do. So a second lesson comes from this, and that is just as love of the Lord and hatred of evil go together, so too godliness and gladness go together. They always have, they always will. When you're walking in godly ways, there will always be gladness in your walk every time. That's why in verse 12, the psalmist calls on them to rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. All right, so, when Christ comes, everything will seem right and everything will seem wrong all at the same time. Everything will seem right for the, because the righteous and just king will have come to take his proper place, that's right. To make all wrongs right, that's good. And all will see him and all will bow to him and acknowledge him as King of kings and Lord of lords, as the King of kings and Lord of lords that he is. Everything will be as it should have been when he comes. But at the same time, the moment he comes, everything will also seem wrong. Everything will be exposed by his righteousness and justice. Everything will be seen for what it truly is. The awful sinfulness of sin will be impossible not to see and it will be impossible not to feel it in his presence. There will be no place to hide. Psalm 97 says all will tremble. Some will be ashamed for loving evil and hating him and the righteous, his saints, the upright in heart will rejoice and give thanks. But this is a problem. Everything will seem right with him, but everything will seem wrong with us. You won't be able to experience the second coming and not ask, who is truly righteous compared to this Christ? David himself has already admitted in Psalm 14, there is no one who is righteous, no, not one. And later Isaiah will add, all our righteous deeds are as filthy rags before God. And so suddenly this psalm that is so full of hope and encouragement at the righteousness and justice of God becomes really a burden and not a blessing. Yes, the Lord is coming, but who can be righteous and ready, really? If God is righteous and just and sin cannot absolutely go unpunished and if sin has infinite guilt and has an infinite nature about it, no finite person like you or me can secure a pardon for ourselves or make satisfaction for our sin. And there's no praying that can fix this. There's no crying. There's no tears that can fix this. There's no humblings. There's no repentings. There's no resolutions to do better. There's no reformations of ourselves that can stop the course of his judgment because God is righteous and just. He's true to his word and he warned that sin brings death and he cannot break his word. And this is why there's no standing before a holy God. That is why he's called a consuming fire. His coming will literally take your breath away. 
Because finally, 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 we will see sin for the awful thing that it is. Finally, 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 we will see holiness for the extraordinary thing that it is. So you've got to come to this psalm and go, what's the point? Why does it raise a hope we can't have? But just wait a minute. Look. Look again. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, God himself will preserve and deliver. The same God who comes is the God who somehow finds a way to preserve and deliver people. Right here, the psalm points us to the heart of the gospel. Indeed, the only way hope can be found is if there's someone who can take our place and our punishment and satisfy God's justice, someone who is strong enough to satisfy God's wrath, for sin and is ready to forgive sin. And Christ Jesus was that one. Christ perfectly fulfilled God's law for us. He performed what the law required of us and he did it perfectly. He suffered the penalty that the law prescribed for us completely. So when we weren't able to fulfill the law or satisfy the penalty of the law, Christ became both our redemption and our righteousness. By God's grace and by his mercy, his life and death for us meant that his righteousness could be given to us. And his perfect righteousness more than fully satisfies the Father's anger with our sin. And this is how the believer can rejoice in God's justice as well as his mercy when Christ comes again. Because there is no accusation that can be leveled against Jesus. There is now no accusation that can be leveled against us. His righteousness has been shared with those who put their faith in him. His righteousness has been given to us and that's why the scripture says he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Do you see what this means? It means that because of this, a believer can come into the presence of a holy God, see his righteousness, see his justice, and rejoice and lie down in peace knowing that they will be presented perfect in the sight of God on that final day when Jesus comes again. And what that means for us is this. We can either run to him and bow to him now with confession and find forgiveness by his blood or we can wait to bow to him later, exposed and unforgiven and remain that way forever. Loved ones, the shared righteousness of Jesus answers all of our fears and doubts, gives us both awe and joy. And so to the question, how can I look up to a holy God? The answer is in the righteousness of Christ. How can I have fellowship with a holy God? The answer is in the righteousness of Christ. How can I find acceptance with God? The answer is in the righteousness of Christ. How can I face the second coming of Christ and the judgment seat? And the answer is in the righteousness of Christ. In him, everything has changed. I am his sin. He is my righteousness. I am his curse. He is my blessing. I am his death. He is my life. I am the wrath of God to him. He is the love of God to me. I am his hell. He is my heaven. He is my heaven. Christ is my life, my joy, my comfort, my reward, my confidence, my all. 
in his righteousness I can safely and comfortably live. I can patiently wait. I can happily die. There's no fear. No craven fear. A great deal of reverential awe to be sure. And a joy that I can hardly fully express. But I can live. I can wait. I can die. And I can say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come. He's given me a righteousness, his righteousness. And allowed me to put it on. And it is a righteousness. That will never fall off. I'm safe. I'm safe. There's no fear in life, no fear in death. I'm here. love him with my whole life. What else can I do? But give him my whole life again and again and again. If I was his help. Heads bowed, eyes closed all across the room. I, you're a follower of Jesus. I want to encourage you in this moment to think long and hard about the second coming of Christ. And what your immediate response is, the thought of his coming and finding you right where you are, right here, right now. I'm wondering, do you, do you find yourself full of fear, anxiety? Do you find yourself full of joy and anticipation? Do you find yourself full of awe and gladness? Where do you find yourself? It will tell you a great deal about where you are right here, right now, spiritually, and perhaps where you need to Oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. Hate evil. Start with yourself. Hate evil. Where the attitudes have been wrong, the actions have been wrong, the truth has not been told. Hate evil. Love him. There are those
those in this room who the reality is you're not ready to die. You're, you're not ready for Christ to come back. You're not ready to hear about judgment. You not ready to hear about a second coming. You're not ready. The God of the universe through his son speaks to you here now and says, come to me. I forgive you of your sins. I'll pardon you your iniquity. I'll make you white as snow and I will make you mine. In just a moment, we're going to sing our song of response. The altar will be open be some business you need to do with the Lord, I invite you to come. You might need today prayer because of something you're facing, something you're going through. We will have men and women here to pray with you as you come. You can come and just kneel and pray. You can come speak with one of us. If you would give your life to Christ today, come speak with one of us and we'll help you to take that step of surrender as you seek his forgiveness and transformation as you seek his gift of new life Lord this is your time not ours we stand in awe and anticipation of that moment that split second Christ will come, gather his people, and then we wait for that time when he will come and reign. Lord, help us to be ready. One and all, help us to be ready. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come. Pray and ask again. Constantly.